everyone. My name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. And with me today is John Brzezowski, who is a longtime IPv6 maven, to say nothing of a very, very long connection with the Internet's evolution and implementation. So, John, thanks for joining me today. It's an honor, Vince. Thank you. So our topic today uh, is IPv6 on by default, but I want to take you back to June 6, 2012, when we made a big announcement basically saying IPv4 is over, it's time for IPv6, the era has begun. That was 10 years ago. Uh, here it is 10 years later, and as far as I can tell, we still haven't got more than maybe on average of 30 or maybe 35% implementation writ large. In some places, it's very uh, imp heavily implemented. Uh, some organizations have full up IPv4 and IPv6 capability, and some have very little. So we should talk a little bit about that. But I'd like you to refresh my memory uh, for a moment. When we made this big announcement on June 6, 2012, there something followed called happy eyeballs, which was sort of a way of testing whether your V6 connection was working. When did, did we announce that then, or was that later? And what did it do for people? Then it was, um, you know, if, if I can quote a good friend of ours, Stuart Cheshire from from Apple, who um, I, I spoke to in advance of you know, our discussion here. Um, you know, happy eyeballs, a Apple and, and Google and others had a heavy hand in the creation of it. And if you look back then to 11 years ago, uh, World IPv6 Day, which was preceded by World IPv6 Launch, a lot of the learnings that came into those two events really uh, fueled the innovation around, you know, approaches and technologies like Happy Eyeballs. While while there was awareness and implementations being born leading up to World IPv6 Launch, which was you know the, the you know kind of the decade long, you know, a decade ago event that we're celebrating, many of those implementations really took you know took root after World V6 launch itself and, and frankly changed the game as far as adoption was concerned. It really made this idea that if there was anything wrong or impaired about a V6 implementation, that it wasn't going to you know, affect adoption in any way. And it has truly done just that. It was, it was a huge game changer for the acceleration of adoption. Well, certainly a, a number of companies, mine included at Google, offered quite a range of services uh, accessible through IPv6, including various streaming video kinds of applications. So it was a really good test of our implementation. Well, let's talk a little bit about what the consequences are of turning IPv6 on by default everywhere. Uh, the first observation, I guess, is that does it still work or does it, uh, could it work with pure IPv6 and no IPv4 at all? This is sort of IPv6 only. What's your general sense right now about our ability to operate without benefit of IPv4, setting aside those people who don't have IPv6 at all, and so it doesn't work without IPv4, but if, they, if they've got IPv6, do you think IPv6 only is feasible at this point? From a, from a consumer-facing internet perspective, then probably not, uh, I'm sad to say, right? I think the fundamentals are there. Um, I think people could use V6 to get V4. We can, you know, if we have time, we could dive into that. But where I've personally seen the greatest amount of success, both, both firsthand and in kind of collaboration with others, is where V6 only is used for you know, internal purposes, you know, larging, uh, you know, managing large deployments of, you know, cable modems, mobile phones, you know, et cetera, uh, hugely, uh, hu hugely usable in that space. And, and there are many, there are many use cases to point to in the field today that are boasting you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of devices. So, so turning IPv6 on by default uh, doesn't necessarily turn off IPv4, although uh, we'll have to get to the point where uh, we can either do that or it's being supported, I guess, by some sort of address translation technique. And am I correct that we already have ways of getting to IPv4 even if we're starting from an IPv6 uh, address? Absolutely. I mean, if you if you look at our friends at T-Mobile, uh, you know, absolutely a poster child for uh, you know, for for exactly this topology, this deployment methodology. Um, many of their of their devices, um, V6 only, if not all, um, all still very much allowing for you know you know equal access to both V4 and V6 content wherever it happens to be you know, hosted. So the obvious thing about IPv6, of course, is the enormously larger address space. Although I confess to you, I was a little nervous when I heard that they were going to start allocating 
64 bit prefixes and 64 bits of address space for everybody to use, you know, I'll call it locally. It seemed like that would consume it at a rather rapid pace, uh, having been uh, sort of stung by the rapid pace of IPv4 consumption. Uh, but let's uh, set that aside for just a second. Some people say, well, IPv6 is more secure than IPv4, and I'm not so sure about that. What's your reaction to that statement? I think from an implementation perspective, you're, you're probably right, Ben, right? An implementation is an implementation. Some have made the argument that the, the vintage of the implementations have afforded either A, an opportunity for a fresh look and cleaner code, or less less runtime, right? So we both know that after many decades of, of running code, that's that's how we really you know, ensure that it's secure. It's really through running yeah. it through its paces, right? The, the, the one thing that I can tell you for sure is that the vastness of an address of the address space, it does present some challenges. It's like trying to find a piece of hay, a very specific <laughs> piece of hay in a haystack, right? Um, so so that does that does present some interesting challenges, which I think over time, you know, people will find creative ways to to overcome. Um, but but I think, you know, I think you and I are generally on the same page. You know, like there, there's still there's still many you know, m- many decades for us to to kind of catch up on as around you know the longevity of running code and maturity that it affords implementations. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about efficiency because my understanding is that when the IPv6 uh, was finally concluded, uh, as you will recall, there were many competing uh, alternatives, and when it finally settled out, the v6 format had some uh, simplifications. Uh, it took some things away that weren't be needed or did not appear to be needed after our experience with V4. Uh, it looks like it's a more easily parsed uh, format, and that might lead to some efficiency. Am I guessing correctly about that? Yeah, I, I mean, at this stage, you know, the you know, if I look way, you know back 20 years when you know early early days of V6, you know, when routers were still moving packets and, and software, not hardware, um, you know, there, there were there were many there were many aspects of v6 that were still very rudimentary in nature right yeah as, as you look over the years how how slack temporary addressing privacy addressing all these things have taken shape very much you know hinging around you know, the 64-bit boundaries as far as you know uh local area use is concerned um there's there's been a lot of predictable and frankly you know usable implementations that have that have, that have held from from that from from the basis that you know ipv6 was born from so we know that IPv6 is not 100% implemented everywhere. Otherwise, we might not be having this conversation. Uh, and let's hope that 10 years from now, we will be having a conversation celebrating the fact that we've got it everywhere. Um, is there any pattern to where it is and where it isn't in terms of the parties that have implemented and turned on IPv6? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you and I had, had kind of, um, you know, had the opportunity to kind of see one another a little while ago, We've talked about this, right? And um, you know, in the in the in the time period that trailed World IPv6 launch, we saw a lot of adoption. Uh, the largest carriers on the planet, whether they were fixed line or wireline, uh, we saw you know you know giants in the content space, you know Google, you know Facebook, Netflix, etc., all 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 adopt as well. I think over the past ten years, man, and and like wow, it's been ten years. Holy cow! <laughs> and, I, and I really do hope I really do hope that you and I are not doing this again in another ten years. Um, you know, I think what we found was that you know the landscape across the internet has changed. Um, you know, ten years ago, you know, cloud. I mean, other than internally at you know in Google and, and perhaps you could come on this, there wasn't really like a you know like a like a commodity you know commercial cloud mm-hmm. that people were were kind of using you know heavily, right? Um, so, but now they are, right? And, and I think you're finding that a lot of those folks. Um, while, while some of them have kind of began their journey from a B6 point of view, there's still a great deal of work to be done as far as you know, you know, public cloud is concerned. Um, and CDNs, you know, I think folks like the names I've listed previously on the content side, they took it upon themselves because they had they had absolute you know, control over their own infrastructure. But we still have CDN players of, the, of a massive variety that are still, you know, not really turning it on by default, which I think is a pretty important part of the theme that we've been talking about here IPv6, you know, on by default. You know, one last comment, and then uh, I'll hand it back. But if, if you look back to kind of the commitment that we all made, and, and there was really a small, uh, a very tightly knit group of folks who, who kind of engineered these events, we all agreed on by default, um, and and leave it on, right? Um, even in some cases, 
you know, consumers didn't even have the ability to turn it off. That's how committed, you know, the, the, the initiative was, right? So, so I think, I think we're, we're there again, just a different set of players. So, you know, it's interesting to think a little bit about the architecture of the internet. And as you suggest, it certainly uh, seems to be changing. One thing that's happening is that the uh, cloud providers are building additional uh, networking infrastructure in order to meet the internet service providers that our customers are connected to. And so there's a, uh, I would say a trend towards uh, getting from the initial uh, internet service provider into some cloud-based backbone network. Certainly that's true for us at Google. Uh, and I don't know to what extent that uh, does anything to IPv6 implementation, but it does say that since a lot of the carriage is going to be on these uh, cloud-based backbone networks, we want them to be fully up and running on IPv6 to be ready for anyone who turns IPv6 on at all. Do uh, you suppose that, that it would be helpful for us to figure out how to show where V6 is running and where it is not? Because I think Jeff Houston at APNIC, who's their chief scientist, has been trying for some time now to capture information about IPv6 implementation. And maybe making that uh, more visible would be a helpful step as we try to get to IPv6 on by default everywhere. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, the the folks at Nanog, Vint, um, I, I you know I had the pleasure to to address the community back in the fall, and uh, my first reaction to the to the to the folks was, wow, like we're still talking about trying to encourage you know V6 you know adoption here. I was like, you know, some of us have been there, done that, right? And you know, and so I, I went digging, Vint, right? Uh, I went digging and found like we we still have you know widely aggressively adopted open source projects that start their life off and before and spent before only and spend many years that way. Um, so to to, un, to unpack a little bit of your comment about Jeff, I think I think there's a lot of value in that because what I think what you'll find is that you know if you follow the trail of breadcrumbs, you'll find that a lot of that starts with the fact that people are just going to roll their deployments out with what they have. And if it were v6 on by default, I'm going to use Kubernetes as a great example. I know Kubernetes has made some some you know fantastic you know, um, you know enhancements as of late, but for many years now, it's really been a v4 only story, right? And when it comes to how people have chosen to deploy their products and services, a lot of that ultimately was you know being hampered by the fact that it was just from a v6 perspective is v4 only right so i think i think um i've been i mean like you I have an enormous amount of respect for jeff he's a, he's a great fan and, and he's you know a brilliant speaker right and um and there's a lot of amazing work that he does that i think could help to very art you know eloquently articulate you know kind of the blind spots that we might have in front of us today so let's imagine that we succeed in getting everybody to turn on ip6 on by default i wonder what happens if all the hotels in the world that are essentially renting rooms because they have good quality IP, the internet service. I wonder what happens if IPv6 is on by default, how many guests would be calling saying, help, help, I can't get this to work. But that'll be an important test and maybe that's something we should be pushing for. Uh, let, me, uh, let me move on to one other uh, question I have about uh, current implementations of IPv6. If they haven't been heavily exercised, of course, we don't know what the quality of the implementation is. And so one of the things that might happen is that if we go down this path and we succeed in getting people to turn IPv6 on as a normal process, I guess we should be uh, prepared for uh, a number of things to break uh, and, uh, and to encourage people not to turn it off as a fix, but to fix the problem so that we can keep running with IPv6. But it may be we'll have to <clears throat> push that pretty hard. I think, I think then if I may, a comment, you know, um, I remember back in the mid, you know, like 2005 timeframe you know, and before it was, um, it was, it was, it was pretty eye opening for me, right. You know, um, you know, software switched software packet movement, you know, for V6, you know, you know, ASIC hardware based for V4, um, a lot, a lot of work to be done on just basic implementations, you know, even just configuring things like point to point interfaces between, you know, heterogeneous, you know, vendor environments was just not, it just just didn't work, right? Um, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years, a lot of that, a lot of that's been, you know, water under the bridge for, for many moons now, and um, you know, certainly scale tested. So I, part of me says just based on my own my own firsthand experience, you know, things of you know scale, uh, you know, nature, 
probably less of a concern for me. Uh, you know, things like, you know, ed- edge cases might be, you know, varying by, by use case, right? So like, are there certain types of deployments that have very specific requirements um, that, that may not have been, you know, um, thoroughly vetted? And I, and I think Vin, that the only thing that I can share with you from my own personal experience is when you, when, when you rely on V6 to run your business, you, you, you very quickly find out what, what doesn't work and you, you come up with very creative ways to get it there, right? Well, certainly and, I, and, I think, and I think that's the key. I, I agree with that. Certainly everybody running around with mobile phones probably always has a V6 capability if, if, if it's going to work at all. I remember having, uh, I made my engineers wear pagers after we turned our software over to the operations teams. So if things didn't work, the engineers got awakened as well as the ops guys. And it's amazing how quickly bugs got fixed. Well, one other thing, just uh, just to kind of round up here, uh, the, the first observation that I would want to make is that at Google, we discovered that we ran out of IPv4 address space uh, for our own network, the internal network. The amount that we were able to allocate in private address space uh, wasn't sufficient. And so we actually switched over to IPv6 uh, in our internal network in order to allow continued growth that gives you a sense for scale. Uh, I think that it would be really wonderful uh, if we could identify a uh, let's turn IPv6 on permanently uh, day and uh, and try to make that stick and then ask you know to get a good um, uh, feedback mechanism so we can find out you know and get reported any issues arising so that everybody can learn from the experience. I, I couldn't agree more. And just to use your your example about the Google network, many others who've been confronted by the same. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, man. It's it's a business challenge, right? You know, you there comes a point in time where you're, you know you have to kind of decide, like, am I going to continue to invest in in V four, or am I going to invest in V six and free myself from the constraints of V four so that I can operationalize the same? G- Google's done that with this network. Um, you know, l- large fixed and wireless providers have done the same for, for the you know the the large volume of devices that they have to provide IP to, whether it's a mobile phone or a cable modem. Um, and if you just look at things like the public cloud, things like Kubernetes, very hungry when it comes to IP utilization. Um, there are many analogs there that I think we can we can continue to learn from as we as we you know we push forward. So it sounds to me like uh, you and I, anyway, are in complete sync. It's time to turn this on on a permanent basis by default. And so uh, you and I are now committed to that. Let's see whether we can get the rest of the world to agree with us. Meanwhile, thanks so much for taking the time to have this chat, uh, John. It's always a big help to get real detailed responses from people like you who've got their fingers dirty in the pie. Uh, it, and, uh, at this point, uh, I think it's time for us to finish up our chat and look forward to a response coming from the rest of the internet world. Thank you. Um, as always, a great friend, a mentor. Cannot thank you enough for, for being here you know, with us and, and, um, and being part of this conversation.